Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith. God's grace and our faith working hand in hand. His kingdom, I'm going to teach on kingdom. We're going to continue our series on kingdom today. God's empowerment and man's response to it has been the absolute common thread throughout the entire word of God. I mean, whether if you're looking back at the Old Testament, Joshua and Caleb came back, right? God's grace was there to take the land, right? In fact, Moses commanded 12 to go, and the instructions were very, very um, easy to understand. They were very precise. He instructed them, we won't turn to the scripture right now. He instructed them, he said, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the, this is the point. Go scout out how we are to take the land. He never said anything about if. Amen. He said, go over there, scout it out, and come back and tell us how we're going to do this. Why? Because it was already promised. It was a promise that was right there for them. And Moses took one man from each of the 12 tribes and he said, you know what? Go, go over there, scout it out, and tell us how we're how we going to do this. Somehow between that command and them getting there and getting back, somehow they got everything switched up in their mind and it became a suggestion instead of a promise. Now, this is big because there are a lot of promises that we have been given. New Testament verse of Scripture says all the promises of God are yea or yes, and in him are yes and amen. So when there's a promise from the word of God, if he declares it, then our job is just to say, yes, amen, I receive it. Yeah. It's not to debate about if he really meant it or not. Come on, somebody. It's not up for discussion. God says, by his stripes you were healed. Now, the, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 53, says, by his stripes you are healed. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, after the cross, quotes that verse of scripture in the past tense. He said, by whose stripes you were healed. When? At the cross. But pastor, I'm, I'm in pain. Well, that's okay. Don't deny the pain. Just deny its authority in your life over what God's word said. I'm not a sick man trying to get well. I'm a healed man because God's word says by his stripes I was healed. I'm a healed man that the enemy is trying to bring down. He's got one job. Yeah, have you ever seen those memes where, where somebody messes up or somebody in a, and they get back and they're like, you had one job, <laughs> right? <laughs> Satan has one job. It's three, it manifests in three ways, but his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. He, his job description, I hear that, brother. His job description is literally to steal, kill, or destroy. So if something is being stolen in your life, don't ever, ever. Then there are some words in our house, never and always are words that you want to try to not use, especially when in the heat of the moment, right? But there are some, those words carry big authority. We are to never attribute something that's being stolen in our life to God trying to teach us a lesson. Because he's not a thief. Amen. Now, does the Bible say what the enemy meant for harm, God can turn it into good? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. But God didn't create the harm to teach you a lesson. If something's being stolen, if something is trying to be uh, killed in your life, a relationship or a, um, a, a dream, Satan is a dream killer. That's what he wants to do. He wants to come in, like Mark 4 says, the sower sows the word. The very first type of seed is when the word is sown, that immediately, what's the very first type out of four seeds? What, the fowls come in and scoop it up. They eat it before it even has a chance to germinate, right? So the enemy's job is to steal the word of God from your life, from your heart, because the soil is heart, is the heart in, in that parable. So the enemy's job is to steal it. If he can't steal it before it gets germinated, then he's going to see to it that you're run by emotions because the second type of seed immediately springs up, but then there's no depth of earth in it, right? Let me read this. Mark chapter four. Hallelujah. I'll just go ahead and just jump into it. 
Mark 4, and the first type of seed, I'll go to the Jesus, uh, he gave the parable in verses 3 through 9, but I'm going to read when he's back in the green room with the disciples, he's explaining to them what he just said out there, okay? He said, these are, these are those that are sown by the wayside, right? This is important. This is important. Verse 14 says, the sower sows the word. And in verse 13, Jesus said, you don't know what I'm talking about? They came and they asked him, Master, what are you talking about? He said, listen, you guys don't understand what I'm saying? He said, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of the parables. I read that verse of scripture, Mark 4, 13, about 25 years ago. And I remember Holy Spirit jarring me to my core, and it became so real to me, I studied this parable probably for 90 days. I just devoured it in every translation I could get in because the master, the king of the universe, said if you don't get this one, you won't understand any of the parables. You won't understand the prodigal son if you don't understand this one. Is, is that what he said? Or am I, just, am I just reading things? that Does my Bible say what your Bible says? Yes. Amen. Can we agree that if Jesus said this is, if you don't understand this, you won't understand any of them, how many of you understand that we need to understand this? Yes. That's a lot of understanding. <laughs> These are those sown by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard Satan, 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 yep. Satan, immediately comes and taketh. He's a thief. Yes. That's what he does. He takes. He takes away the word that's sown in their hearts. Now, why does he want to take the word? Because the word's the number one thing that can put you over in any area. Yep. The word changes you. <laughs> this, oh, do, do we not understand how vital this, if some people call it a good book, well, that's okay to call it that, but it's, it's sharp. It's, it's um, alive. Yeah. Hebrews 4.12 says it's quick. That word, that's an old English word meaning alive. Yeah. If, you don't, if you doubt that anyway, just go ahead and stick a, stick a needle up in the quick of your thumbnail and tell me real quick if you're not alive. <laughs> but the word is quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides spirit and soul. So it'll carve out of you the thing that you think is spiritual but really is emotional. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Don't just sit around your whole life waiting to hear, I just wish God would speak to me. Well, there's his word. Go read it. I just want to hear God speak to me. Well, read it. There's so much here. It takes most people like a year of a plan to read through the whole thing. Just take a year. Ah, you don't understand. I want to hear him audibly. Well, read it out loud. <laughs> if, you, if you want to hear the word of God audibly, read it to where you can hear it then. <laughs> I said that to somebody one time, and he looked at me. <laughs> this, this for like it seemed like thirty seconds, you know. But no, it's the truth. And, and so the second type of seed is sown on. Uh, excuse me, verse seventeen says they have no root on themselves. So the soil, they don't have any root in themselves. So they endure for a time, and then when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, persecution arises to prove the word's true. Now, it rains on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. There is a God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Satan is the God of this world. And he just wants to steal, kill, and destroy everybody. He, he doesn't play favorites. So don't think that you're going to have more temptations or trials or anything else than the next guy. It's going, it's, the sun is going to shine on all of us. The, sun's going to, the rain's going to rain on all of us, amen, from time to time. But persecution comes because you're standing for something. Didn't Jesus say to his disciples after dealing with the rich young ruler? He said, uh, Peter was astonished because the rich young ruler ran away and he was so sorrowful. And Peter said, how can this be, Lord? And Jesus said, he said, there's not anybody that has given away or left, excuse me, I'll try to, try to quote it as close as I can, has left father or mother or brothers or sisters or houses but shall not receive in this lifetime a hundredfold, what do you say though? With persecution. Yes. Yeah. See, when the world looks at the system that you're living in, they want nothing else than to prove that the system, the kingdom system that I'm going to teach about today, I guess I already am. Because later on in this chapter, he says the kingdom is as a man should sow seed into the ground, right? Verse, th verse um, 
uh, verse 30 says, Where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it's sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth, but when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. So then, in this very same parable, and I'll get to the other two types of seeds real quick, but in this very same parable, he says, Jesus says, the kingdom of God, all of it, the whole kingdom can be compared as a man that would go and sow a seed in the ground. Now, I'm just going to preach my sermon. This isn't offering time. I'm not preaching on seed offering. I'm preaching on the seed that's on the inside of you. Yes. Because here's the thing. The word, all of it is seed. The first type of seed is stolen before it even takes root. The second type of seed starts to germinate. You hear a, hear a sermon and, and you're like, man, whoa, that was amazing. But then Wednesday's coming. Maybe for some of us, it's just Monday morning. Maybe for some of us, you get to the parking lot and you see that text message that somebody sent you. And if you don't have any root in yourself, the seed can't germinate and go deep. Satan wants to steal your joy and steal all those things before it even has a chance to really pop out of the ground. That's why we have to have the depth of the word of God. That's why we call ourselves faith building church. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word, amen? The third type of seed, Verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns. This is the most common type of believer. I would, I would venture to say, not just in this room, but in the church worldwide, this is the number one issue that this is the place where most people are in their spiritual walk. Because yes, most of us, we won't let the enemy steal the word. We've we're been in church long enough and we're uh, literate enough about the word to understand what it's saying. So we're not going to let the, the enemy steal it before we even grasp it. And most of us, especially in this church, I know you guys. You guys are, uh, Chuck Lowry uh, always used to joke about himself and me. He said, man, I like talking to you. I'm a fellow word nerd, right? <laughs> I like talking about the word. I like, I like getting the word inside me. And so there's depth there. But this third type is very, very dangerous. Now watch this. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, now watch this, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in and choke the word, and watch this, it becomes unfruitful. It becomes unfruitful. That is where the vast majority, I would venture to say 70, 80 plus percent of the body of Christ is in this category where they're past the point of letting somebody tell, you know, you've come too late to tell me that God doesn't save people. You've come too late to tell me that God's grace isn't sufficient. You've come too late to tell me that I can't live by faith. You have come too late to tell me that the love walk doesn't work. I'm gonna walk the love walk because James calls it the royal law, the law of love. You've come too late to tell me all those things. And I'm also past the point where I have some depth in me. But now this third type, oh boy, is it tough. Because the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things, those things can choke out what the word is trying to produce in your life. I've known a lot of people that have heard sermons on, on the grace of God, for example, for, for a time, three months, six months, a year. And then all the situations and circumstances of life are happening around them, and they choose to believe the situations and circumstances over what God's word says. The word of God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, see, the apostle Paul was right in the middle of an absolute storm. I mean, not not a literal storm, but he was going through it. There was a messenger sent from Satan to buffet him. In other words, there's no really having to argue about what the Paul's thorn in the flesh was. The Bible says it was a messenger sent from Satan to buffet him or to be a, a buffer against what he was trying to do for the kingdom. Amen. And so everywhere he preached, he preached on the goodness of God and somebody somewhere was like a thorn in the flesh. I I chuckle about this sometimes because I, I preach the sermon. <laughs> I just don't even want to. It's, it's, you have to hear the whole sermon to understand. But it was, it was talking about uh, the pricks. Because 
you know, God told Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? And then also later on, he says, uh, in this very, very setting, he said, uh, a thorn in the flesh. Now, a thorn in the flesh in that day was almost like what we would say, a pain in the neck today. That's what it was. His thorn in the flesh was a pain in the neck that was trying to come against everything he was trying to do. The entirety of the new covenant of God's grace and his love and his mercy and the walk of faith, Paul was the one that was laying the whole foundation. He didn't have a Bible to open up to and get this stuff and regurgitate it to somebody on Sunday morning. He went on the backside of the desert in Arabia. He spent 15 years, read the first two chapters of Galatians. He spent 15 years honing this and allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to it, minister it to him. Before he wrote any of these letters and anything what we call the Bible, God was downloading the word to you through him. And so when he goes to God three times, ah, has anybody ever gone to God three different times or 37 and said, Lord, will you take this away from me? Take this away from me. Take this away from me. Well, three different times, the Lord answered him and said the same thing three times. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, people preach that sermon, and they preach it like, oh, see, Paul just had to endure. He just had to put up with it, and God's grace just signed through. No, you're missing the whole point of what grace is. Grace is not mercy. Grace is not mercy. And, and I'll give this. We have some new people in here. I'll give this really quickly. A grace period on your insurance policy is really should be called a mercy period if we're, if we're talking biblical terms because it's a second chance to get something right. A grace period, oh, I wish insurance companies offered biblical grace periods. Because if my insurance premium was due on March 1st, a grace period means that the week before that, they would send me a check to endorse and turn around and send it back to them to pay the premium. That's biblical grace. It is God providing something that you can't provide for yourself. It's God stepping in and providing a part of him, really the essence of all that he is. He knows your situation. He knows what you're up against. He knows how to get information to you because he knows how to get to the other side of your situation. That's what Ephesians 1's talking all about. Put Ephesians 1 verse 17 on the screen. Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus was that they would learn something. They would see the light on something, right? He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, we give to you the spirit of wisdom. That's the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom, and watch, revelation in the knowledge of him. Oh, that phrase is so big. Remember, this is not just knowledge that he's everlasting and he's this and he created the world in six days and all this stuff. No, it's not God trivia. It's his knowledge that he has about your situation to get you over to the other side that you need because you don't know how to get to the other side of this issue. He knows how you need to get to the other side of this issue. That's why you need revelation in the knowledge of him or his knowledge about what you're going through. Glory be to God. The third type of soil, Mark 4, wants to take the fruit, stop this word from being fruitful right in the middle of your situation, your circumstance, your trial. It wants to, how can I say this? We are called to ex exhibit a lot of different kind of fruit, okay? Part of, the, part of it is the fruit of the Spirit, right? Nine things listed, love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, temperance, self-control. Um, we're supposed to exhibit fruit of that. But now the Word produces fruit. The word of God, the Bible also talks about fruits of righteousness. There is a place that you can get in life where people around you see fruit that is coming out effortlessly. Remember the very definition of fruit, there's not a vine or a branch, specifically the branch, that ever tries to produce fruit. There's not one in the world. The branches, because of the vine, the branches produce fruit. Watch this. And some people don't like it when I start preaching like this. Effortlessly. Amen. Effortlessly. Well, I thought being a Christian was hard work. Well, now the Bible talks about laboring to enter into rest. That's the hard part. 
because you've got all these things like that third type of seed. You've got cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things that are coming in and they're doing their best to choke out everything that you're just trying to produce. But if you'll just labor to enter into rest and don't sweat all that other stuff and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, fruit will be produced without you having to manufacture the fruit. No believer has ever built fruit of himself. No, it's all the work of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you coming out into the lives of the people around you. That's what we're called to do. And if we get trapped into making all this other stuff happen, now I'll just, I'll segue into what I came to teach today. (laughs) And that's this. We've got to get our priorities straight where the kingdom's concerned. We've got to get our priorities straight because the enemy will try to get us off of that fourth type of seed that's sown. And as you know, the fourth type of seed is seed that produces a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. The whole point of that sower sowing the word, I'll finish up here, says this in verse 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground such as hear the word of God and receive it. This this is the definition of good ground. Test your heart this morning. Are you hearing the word? Well, everybody in here is listening, but is everybody in here hearing what I'm saying? Jesus defined that. He said, those of you that have ears to hear, let him hear. Everybody in there was listening with their physical ears, but are you listening with the ears of your heart this morning? If you are hearing the word, now watch this, and receive it. The word brings forth fruit because the word of God is the thing that builds faith. Faith comes by hearing the word. The word of God will produce it. The sower sows the word. It's the seed. It's the washing of the water of the word. It says in 1 Peter, it talks about um, how the word of God is like water. So the word of God produces this. And if you hear it and you receive it, now that's an act of faith. That is saying, Father, I'm going to receive this no matter what these other cares of life and deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I choose to receive what you're saying to me, Lord. And this could be any part of the word of God. If you're struggling with something physically, receive God's word for health this morning. If you're struggling and you say, well, I just can't seem to figure out the answer. Well, guess what? You never will. Because this three pounds of gray matter between your ears is not capable of knowing everything that he knows. Amen? God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But it goes on to say in Isaiah 55 that just like the rain comes down and the snow comes down and doesn't return, so will my word go forth. His word has come down and it hasn't returned void. It always accomplishes the thing that it's set out to accomplish when we hear it and receive it. That's our job. We just have to uh, make a concerted effort and make a decision. That's maybe a better way to say. Just make a quality decision that I'm going to hear his word and I'm going to receive it. I'm not going to receive what the news is saying about the economy. Because I operate out of a different economy. I operate out of heaven's economy. It doesn't matter if the stock market tanks and drops... 20,000 points tomorrow. Are you not much better than the birds? They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Don't you have a tongue and aren't you, haven't you been made in his image and in his likeness? You're a speaking spirit that can dominate your world with the dominion that's been placed on the inside of you. See, so I'm just an ambassador sent from the motherland to another land and I'm operating in the other land just how the motherland tells me to operate. Glory be to God. So what are our priorities? What are, what are our kingdom priorities? And this is, I'll just reiterate, this is something you have to see. It's just like Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. It's just like Jesus told to Nicodemus, right? In John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus, except a man be born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, John 3, 3, if you put that on the screen so they can see it. Except a man be born from above, He cannot see the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is something that we can see. 
Now, we have got to make it a priority. Just today, with whatever time I have left, just make a quality decision today that you are going to receive what the Word says about kingdom, and it's going to be a priority to you. It's got, listen, the world, I'll get into this here in a second, but the world has deceived us for years into thinking that what's important is not important, and the things that aren't important are important. Yes. Yeah. I defined priority. Priority, actually, I borrowed it from Sir Webster. There's a couple different things he said about it. Priority, here's one thing, principal thing. Most important thing. A priority is one of the most important things in your life. If you have a baby, that's how, how old is she now? Two weeks, old. Two weeks old. How many of you know that that's a priority in their life? <laughs> and if they want to think that it's not, she will remind them at 1.30 in the morning that she's a priority. <laughs> Actually, I don't want to speak that over her life. We'll just com command sweet sleep. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. But here's the thing. Priority, when you prioritize something, you put it above the other things. The principal thing, the most important thing, primary focus. What's your focus on? Because how many of you know that where your eyes go, you follow? That's why the word of God refers itself, uh, refers to itself, I should say, as light. God is love and God is light. If we turned every light off in the room and tape, duct taped all the uh, cracks shut and it was completely dark in here, if I lit a match wherever I was in the room, if I lit a match over in the corner, every set of eyes would go to the light. We crave light. Principal thing, most important thing, primary focus, highest value. What kind of value are you placing on the kingdom of God versus religion? I'll get there in a minute. The last thing I borrowed from Webster is first among all others. A priority is first. Your number one priority, at least, is first. Yes, amen. We need to find out what it is, the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom, how it operates, and watch this, what our place is in the kingdom. That's got to be our number one focus. I'll show you where Jesus tells us that that's supposed to be our number one focus. I'll give you a hint to the end of the sermon. Seek first the kingdom. But here's the thing, you guys. Human psychology has told us that, um, let me just say they have it completely backwards. Anybody ever studied much of psychology? My mom has a master's in psychology. Have fun growing up in that house, right? <laughs> I did, I did, I'm just joking. But she analyzed everything I did, which was good. I needed it, right? But psychology, anybody ever take a psychology class? Even Psych 101, right? I took a psychology class in college. Not very much fun. But I did study enough to read about a guy named Abraham Maslow. Now watch this. I'm going to Maslow, Maslow. You say tomato, I say potato. We put that, put that, uh, <laughs> you say tomato, I say spaghetti sauce, right? <laughs> Go ahead and put that uh, slide on the screen. Maslow said that there is a, there's a hierarchy of needs is what he called it. Now, I have inside the bottom layer of the pyramid or the hierarchy are several things. So I picked them out in order. And this is how he said that humankind, people, you, me, I'm a people, right? This is what he said our priorities should be. Order of importance, right? Water, food, clothes, housing. Now let's just stop right there. First four, water, food, clothes, and housing. Now those are important things, right? Can we all agree that they're important? This is not a pop because I'm not trying to know gotchas. Okay, just stick with me. Those things are important, right? If you don't have water for very long, uh, some bad things start to happen, right? Food, clothing. I'm so glad everybody in here has clothes. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. Hey, Amen. I've read about other kinds of churches that don't prioritize that. I'm glad that you made clothes a priority today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Housing. Of course that's important. But now here's the thing. Listen here. 
As we go up the, the, the hierarchy, he would say that next would be protection or safety, security, and then love and family. There's other things in that little thing, in that little part of the pyramid. Love, family, self-esteem. So by this part, when you're not having to think about food and clothes and water, notice what I just said. When you're not concerned about those things, food and clothes and water, you can get on to some more important things like love, family, self-esteem, and self-actualization. That's what he had the very top of his pyramid, self-actualization. Now, when you put all this together, if you can get all the way to the top of this pyramid, then what they say is that at the top of the hierarchy produces significance. <laughs> significance. So if you can get past food and water and clothes and housing and, let's see, I don't want to miss anything, protection, security, love, family, self-esteem, self-actualization, you can finally get to the place where you know your significance. That's what Psych 101 will teach you. Now, I'm not anti-psychology. God created us. People want to study us and find out things about us and our mind and things. That's good. That's okay. Amen. We're not called to be ignorant. We're called to be, uh, we're called to be full of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. But it doesn't come from what the world would try to say is important. Our priorities should be determined by what the Word of God says, and specifically the kingdom. Now remember, before I go on, just remember the, the last couple weeks, okay, just kind of a very small refresher. The very first thing that God gave to man on the day that Adam opened his eyes was a kingdom. It's the very first thing he gave him. He said, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, I'll read it to you in case some of you are questioning, uh, is that right? And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and watch this, have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and every other living thing that moves on the earth. He gave them dominion. That is what a kingdom is. It's where a king has dominion. It's where a king's word dominates the situation. And there's some things that we're going to learn about a king in the next couple weeks. Hallelujah, some good stuff. A king is not one of them is. A king is not voted in. A king is born into something. It's his birthright. Glory to God. I can't get ahead of myself. But that's coming, I think, next week. But here's the thing. Each one of us lives our life in a way that reveals our priorities. Now stick with me. Will you put those 10, that list of 10 back on the screen just for a moment? Most people literally, now listen to this, are literally driven to work each week just to go get the first four things on that list. They are literally driven by survival. Most people. I don't, I'm not going to put a percentage on it. But most people I've seen are literally working themselves silly, working themselves, what the world would say, to death. And they're worried about those first four things. I gotta make sure I have water and food, clothes, I gotta make sure. Now listen, and they put those things as the highest priority in their life. And Jesus said not to even think about them. <laughs> we'll read that here in a second. Jesus said, take no thought for any of those first four things. Now that is how the kingdom is completely opposite, 180 degrees opposite than what the religious world would try to teach us. Jesus came to reestablish God's number one priority, to get people into a kingdom life. In fact, you can read in the very first few chapters of each of, the, uh, each of the Gospels, Jesus, it said, from that time on, Jesus went about teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he taught. He taught kingdom from the very beginning all the way through the cross, Acts chapter one, verse three. After the cross, he had a precious 40 days 40 days with his 
men and women and disciples. And he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus's number one priority was the kingdom. Amen. And in so many churches, they never talk about the kingdom. Listen, Jesus talked about love. He did talk about faith. He did talk about many things, but they were all from a kingdom mentality. They weren't from a, 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 um, a perspective of trying to attain the kingdom because I have faith or attain the kingdom by some other means. He said when they asked him to pray, how do we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, first of all, hallowed. Your name is so hallowed. But the very next thing he said, before anything, forgiving trespasses or any of those things, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, how? On earth as, as it is in heaven. That is what, before, listen, before any of the part that we had to play, lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil, you know, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. All those things that we have a part to play in is way after in the prayer, in prioritization of, Father, you are so hallowed. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I will submit to you. I'm not, um, words are important. Words are so important. Um, in fact, if you think about it, did you know, have you ever thought that they killed Jesus because of what he said? Not because of what he did. What you say is much more weighty than what you do. First of all, what you say will lead you to what you do. But that hit me. Man, not long ago, I was just in a time of prayer, and I just saw that in my spirit. They killed Jesus for what, his words. They didn't get mad. If you read the times that they wanted to throw him off a cliff, the times they picked up stones to try and kill him, it's times when he said, before Abraham was, I am. They were mad that he said the kingdom was come and he called God Father? No, we, we, don't even, we won't even spell his name. It's G-D. We don't even spell God, right? And he dared to call him his father and then went on to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That's why they wanted to kill him. It was blasphemy. What he said was blasphemy, they thought. It was words of eternal life. And that... My friends, that is the reason that the Apostle Paul later on says in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, or yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that if they had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew what they were doing, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. But now here's, here's the deal. The very first thing God gave man in Genesis 1 was kingdom. And I said this a couple weeks ago, mankind is searching desperately I think this was part one or part two of our Kingdom Life series. Searching desperately for two things, purpose and power. Just about every um, political race is about purpose and power. Every corporate ladder is about purpose and power. Every uh, club, every club you can join from the little club with the secret handshake when you were six years old was about purpose you wanted to belong somewhere, and power. Because if you were in that club, man, you had a whole bunch of people behind you, the strength in numbers, right? It starts from an early age. Now, understanding the kingdom of God shows a believer his purpose and reveals to him the power to carry it out. So the kingdom of God, that's why this is so important. Religion will never get this straight. Religion will absolutely, positively never get this straight. I jotted a couple things about differences between religion and the kingdom. Number one, religion prepares a person to leave earth. The kingdom empowers a person to dominate the earth. I'm going to read that again. If you're like me, if you're like me, you need to hear things a couple different times maybe. Religion prepares a person to leave earth someday. The kingdom infuses power into a person to dominate their world. Yes. Yes. Amen. That's why Jesus said to pray, and I'll, I'll finish my thought that I just stopped halfway short. That's why Jesus told them to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, a strict dispensationalist will tell you, and I agree, although I'm not gonna get real strict about this right now, 
But remember, he was teaching his disciples to pray before the cross. I believe wholeheartedly, Acts 1, verse 3, after the cross, he could teach them in depth things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he could go revisit all those things and say, hey, remember that day that I told you about the sower sows the word? Now do you understand the kingdom's in you? Because on the very first night that he was raised from the dead, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. They didn't receive the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. They received on resurrection morning. And then he told them to wait until the power of the, until the Holy Ghost came upon them. See, the Holy Spirit was on the inside of them, but they couldn't do ministry because the Holy Ghost wasn't upon them. They hadn't been baptized in the power. Amen? That's why it's important. Well, I won't go there. But he said, before the cross, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Jesus told some people in John chapter 8, he said, there are going to be people that are going to say, lo here, lo there. He said, the kingdom of God shall be in you. See, so after the cross, now I'm not going to get strict about this. I let my kids pray the Lord's Prayer. I pray the Lord's Prayer because I pray the manifestation of, of it. But the kingdom doesn't have to come. But I do pray that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven because I declare that the kingdom of God's in me now. Yes. Amen? Hallelujah. We, gotta treat, we can't treat the cross like it's inconsequential, like nothing changed at the cross. The cross changed everything. Amen? Yes, Hallelujah. So that was just some bonus material. But we're not trying to get or attain heaven someday to leave earth. Number two, religion reaches up to God. The kingdom declares that the kingdom, specifically the king, has come down to earth. Third, religion wants to escape earth. The kingdom impacts, influences, and changes earth. Now notice the difference in fear and faith there. And tell me that that religious mindset isn't rooted in fear. Religion wants to escape earth. It's talking, now I, I believe in heaven. There's an eternity. There's an eternity coming, and heaven is going to be amazing. In fact, it's not going to be at all like most of us has pictured it. I'm not going to teach on heaven right now, but the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. The original intent of the earth is going to be restored. We're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp for eternity. You're going to dominate this earth for eternity and have free access back and forth to heaven to earth for eternity. And we're not going to talk and go to Revelation right now. I'll show you that later. But our mindset, see, our mindset is after the second death, what the Apostle Paul calls the second death, after death has been destroyed for the last time, there won't be anything keeping earth from its original design and its original purpose. See, earth has been tainted with sin. Yes. <laughs> Glory be to God. Woo, I'm about to preach myself happy. <laughs> but now listen here. We have the authority as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ to live in a foreign land now and live as if the motherland has absolutely inhabited this other land. Amen. Just like those diplomats, the ambassador to Uzbekistan. I, don't know, I guess we have an ambassador there. We probably have one about every country. The, the ambassador that goes to that foreign nation is not dependent on their economy for his food, not dependent on their economy for his clothes, not dependent on their social economic order. He takes American principles there, and even if it's just in the embassy, there's a little spot of America in Uzbekistan. Everywhere I go, there's a little piece of heaven on earth. Everywhere I'm walking. Everything I say that's, a, a, that's about the kingdom and prioritizes the word, it releases the kingdom of God in my world. Amen. Hallelujah is right. Amen. The last thing I said was religion focuses on part of this earth making heaven. I, I can hear my great grandma pray that right now. Oh, Lord, if we just all make heaven someday. Oh, boy, she meant so well. She meant so well. But that was such a religious-minded thing to say. Lord, if you just all just remain with us until we all make heaven, all these children make heaven someday, Lord. Well, that's fear. Not knowing that the word of God specifically says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That he'll never stop loving us. And I don't have to make heaven. Heaven has made me. Ah. 
whoa, I'd be nothing without heaven on the inside of me. I'd be nothing without the glory of God changing and rearranging everything that I was born into for his glory and his goodness. I'd be nothing without his grace. I'd be nothing without his mercy. I'd be nothing if heaven did not make me. I want to just finish up in Matthew. Well, before I go to Matthew 6, let's go to Matthew chapter 23 really quickly. And then we're going to end up on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 23. Are you getting anything out of this today? Yes. Matthew 23. I'm just going to read a couple of verses of scripture here. Boy, Jesus was given some kind of harsh words to the Pharisees in this chapter. Um, I love reading this chapter. <laughs> well, from a New Testament perspective, reading this chapter on this side of the cross, knowing these kingdom principles. And now if I was in the same room with him, he's talking to the Pharisees before the cross, I wouldn't have had any more clue than they did. Amen. I, that, this is not a holier than thou attitude. We just, we've been made different. We know some things now. Glory be to God. They didn't know. Matthew 23, <laughs> verse 13. <laughs> oh, the audacity that Jesus had just to speak the truth. I love it. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. I'm reading the Amplified Bible. Woe to you, scribes and heresies, pretenders, hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. For you neither enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are about to go in to do so. People that are having a spiritual experience with the Father, that are learning of his goodness and learning of his grace and understanding his great mercy and his great love wherewith he's loved us, people starting to get it. And some pastors saying, well, you just never know what God's going to do. There's none of us worthy, none of us righteous, no, not one. And start completely, well, yeah, in and of my own righteousness, there's not one righteous but I'm not righteous with my own righteousness. Hallelujah. He who knew no sin was made to be sin so that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not righteous myself. I'm righteous with his righteousness. But incorrectly dividing the word of God has keeps religious people having the upper hand and keeping people thinking that they are so unworthy and so no good when the whole story of the gospel is Jesus came to make me worthy. You're not going to magically get worthy a nanosecond before you take your last breath. God made me worthy to be in heaven, to be with him. God made me worthy for all of eternity. Hallelujah. Oh, that's so big. Verse 15 says this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte or one convert. And when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, uh, in the Amplified, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites. You travel over sea and land to make one single proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him doubly as much a child of hell, Gehenna, as you are. What are we trying to do? Get people into a club so that we can get fear into them and so that they can run up to the altar and get saved every other week because I tell everybody how horrible you are? No, my goodness, no. The whole story of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there's nothing good news about me telling you what a, what a low life you are and that there's no hope and you got to just run up here and tell God how bad you are every Sunday morning for at least 10 minutes or else, no. The good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is that while I was a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for me and so that I could be made something completely radically new, a whole new species of being that never existed before the cross except in Adam and Eve. I've been made new. I've been made alive. I'm an eternal being, glory to God, and I'm going to make disciples and I'm going to tell everybody else the good news. Hallelujah. 
Matthew chapter 6, I'll end up here. Now we're going to stay on kingdom for a couple more weeks. And then I'm going to switch gears. We're going to stay on this kingdom teaching. And I'm going to specifically go a direction that a couple, a couple different people have asked me about lately. Um, and I'm going to teach, again, some new things on the kingdom system versus the mammon system. And I'm going to go through at least three or four weeks at, at a minimum. Uh, I, taught, I taught along these lines in the spring of 2014. They're on our website. And I think I taught 14 weeks in a row on kingdom versus mammon. Because Jesus said, if you're in Matthew 6, let's just go ahead and read this. And I'll give you a little preview. But I want to stay on task for my ending today. Matthew 6, verse... Uh, 24. No man. That means, raise your hand and say, I qualify. Women too. Raise your hand. This is to you. This is Jesus Christ, the master of the universe, the king of all kings. He is saying specifically in red letters, he says, no man. This is not an if-then statement. He's telling us that nobody can do what he's about to say. He says, no man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I'm going to get into this here in a couple of weeks, and we'll get into detail where the kingdom of God is concerned, specifically with the mammon system, because that's where the rubber meets the road. That is absolutely that third type of soil that I was talking about earlier, where the seed is sown and the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in and try to choke it out. It's those cares, cares of life. Remember that word here just in a minute. Cares of life enter in to choke out and keep the word from becoming fruitful or being fruitful. Now, verse 25 says this. Hallelujah. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, Really, really quickly, put that slide back up on the screen, those 10 things. I want you to see these one more time before we get in here. Water, food, clothes, housing, specifically water, food, clothes. I mean, just the very, very basics. What most people would agree, if we went out on the streets and just took a camera crew and just started asking people, what are the, what are the most basic needs that you have in life? What are the most basic things? Everybody would say food and water and clothes. Everybody would say food and water and clothes except maybe some of the kids that play Fortnite. Maybe they'd say Fortnite. <laughs> but, but now keep that in mind. Take no thought, he says, verse 25, for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Take no thought. I define that, and I'll, I'll extrapolate this idea out a little bit here in a few weeks, but take no thought literally means have no care, no fear, and no worry. Care, fear, and worry has the potential to dominate you to the place that it will lead you ultimately even to an early grave. There are people that are so worried, ulcers, and and congenitive heart failure and all these things that are set in by being worried. Yes. And Jesus is telling them, listen, don't even think about these things. I mean, I jotted this down in my notes. This statement from Jesus directly, directly confronts and contests Maslow's hierarchy. He just in one statement flipped the ideology and the psychology of the whole world completely upside down by coming into the room or the mountainside and saying, don't even think about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or what you'll wear. What is this, what's this guy talking about? Don't even think about what I'll wear. Jesus shows us not to worry and that none of these needs, what, listen to this, if you haven't written anything down today, if you're taking notes, write this down. None of those needs, food, water, clothes, how, all those things that we think are important, 
Not one of those needs should ever be our motivator for action. I'm going to say that again. None of those needs should be a motivation for our activity or our action. I don't go out. Now, pastor, what? you don't think I should go to work? Yes, go to work. God gave you a job. But don't worry. Don't be careful for it. Don't worry about it. Care, fear, and worry. Don't be afraid. Oh, if somebody, you know, if they start laying people off, I'll be the first one to go. And you know that I, I don't have that uh, Dave Ramsey course mastered. I don't have my six months, you know, whatever. Uh, I haven't done that. And if I'm the first one to go, my kids won't eat and we're going to starve to death. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? No, don't even think of it. Did he give you that job? If you can't say yes, then you need to pray about the job you're in. Hello. If he did give you that job, He's not going to take it from you. And if somebody does take it from you, he's got another one. <laughs> My goodness. Let's not even allow ourselves to come close to saying that those things that Jesus, he's specifically saying they're not even important. Don't take any thought about them. Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? I'm not going to get into that right now. I will in a couple weeks, but you can sow. You can reap. You can gather into barns. You can speak over your seed. You can dominate your world. Yes. The bird can't do that. Yes. That's why going home and praying and hallelujah. I don't want to be irreverent when I say this. Don't waste your prayer life praying for food. Don't sow in the offering plate so that you'll have groceries next week. Yes, <laughs> you got it completely backward. That is not it. A bird has never sowed a thing in its life, and he's never missed a meal. Glory to God. Which of you, by taking one thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? That literally means one minute to his lifespan. These two verses, 26 and 27, shows that our self-worth is more important than the other basic needs. He said, are you not much better than they? He's establishing. See, Maslow said that's the top of the hierarchy, self-worth, self-actualization, self-esteem. Jesus jumps right into it and says, don't think about food, water, or clothes. He said, the birds have that and immediately comes in on self-worth. He says, aren't you better than them? building worth into them, telling them that they have a purpose, that they have a father that loves them, that has, that. oh, glory be to God. I'm telling you this morning, you've been begotten of a father. Yes. You've got his DNA coursing through your inner man. Yeah. Glory to God. And if, a, if a, a earthly father being evil knows how to give his kids good things, my kid asked me for a piece of bread. I don't give him a scorpion or a stone. That's what the Bible says. If I know how to, being evil, know how to give good gifts, I'm not evil, I guess that's talking about the world, even evil men give their kids bread, how much more will your heavenly Father give you things, give you the Holy Ghost and the things that come by the Holy Ghost? Yes. Verse 28. And why take you thought for raiment? That's clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. You're supposed to watch them grow. I just want to teach that mammon stuff right now. I can't do it. But you're supposed to watch them grow. Watch how they do it. It didn't say you're not supposed to grow. In fact, it's saying you are supposed to grow, but you're supposed to watch a lily how it does it. How? It doesn't toil, neither do they spin, literally on a loom. They don't clothe themselves by spinning a loom, getting the spin cycle. I'll talk about that here in a few weeks. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed or clothed like one lily. Why? Because the lily is clothed from the inside out. Oh, glory be to God. A lily gets its worth. There's not one lily that was ever, the seed fell down there and it was under the soil and it was saying, oh man, why am I just, about, life has just piled on top of me. I'm just buried. <laughs> Can't see any light. I just wonder if anybody out there cares about me. No, the lily just rests where it's planted yes. Yes. and allows itself to grow from the inside out. Glory be to God. Verse 29, and yet I say to you, I just read that one, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, <laughs> which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now there's the connection. There's the faith connection. He says for you 
to not rest in knowing who God's made you to be and be clothed from the inside out. He calls that not no faith or a life of no faith. Hallelujah. Therefore, so he says it again, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, don't let that word Gentiles throw you off. I'm gonna read it in another translation here in a minute. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. He already knows. How many times have we prayed to the Father and gave him all old information? How many times have we prayed the problem? Come on, let's be real. You go to God and you say, oh God, this is happening at work and this is happening. He was there. Oh, God, this person said this about me. He was there. We tell him everything that he already knows as if we're bringing him new information, giving him something new to work with, instead of getting in the word of God and finding out the answer first and then praying the answer. I'm going to say that again, because that is the key to most people's prayer, what most people's prayer life is missing. Yes, there are prayers for answers, but... The Bible says, oh, glory to God, I don't have time to teach on prayer right now. But listen, there's a, a prayer of consecration. There's a prayer when Jesus was in the, the garden. He said, Father, if there's any other way that I can do this, let this cup pass from me. Never, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So he was asking, he was petitioning the Father, but he knew what had to happen. Yes. See what I'm saying? So he's praying from a position of knowing what he was called to do. He already knew when he went to the garden what the answer was and what he was called to do. Amen? Amen. So when we go to the Lord in prayer, Jesus standing, another example, Jesus, I've used this example a lot, standing at the front of the tomb of Lazarus. They roll the stone back and Jesus says, oh God, will you please hear me today? Oh Lord, Lazarus died. No. The very first thing out of his mouth was, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me always. And he goes on to say, I'm not praying this for just for myself, but so everybody else can hear. Oh, glory be to God. Jesus is praying to the Father so that everybody else knew that God was fixing to hear what Jesus had to say. Yeah. Prayed the answer. He didn't pray the question or the problem. He prayed the answer. That's what we're called to do. Ladies and gentlemen, pray the answer. That's why you need to get in here. If you want to hear it audibly, read it out loud. <laughs> Amen. Pray the answer. Now, that word Gentiles in a couple of different translations, in fact, in the Amplified, I'll read it here because this kind of gets in there. It says, uh, verse 32, for the Gentiles, in parentheses, heathen, wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. One translation says pagans, excuse me, pagans. Even the pagans search after what to eat and what to drink and what to wear. How many people put such a priority on what to wear? They don't even go to church for 20 years because they say, I have nothing. The very words of life that could change them forever. They're 20 years behind the eight ball because they don't think that they have something to wear. How sad. And how sad that we have let that happen. Yes. Yes. That we can't be salt and light enough in their world to take this gospel to them and say, no, honey, listen, it's not about what you have to wear. That's the primary reason that I preach in jeans every week. Because it's not about, glory to God. How is a world ever going to understand that God loves them if they don't even think that he can approve of their outfit? How can they possibly be convinced that the, our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe cares intimately and deeply about their very thoughts, the intents of their heart, the things that they have need of. Keep going down the list. There's so many things. And that his grace is right there. Listen here. His grace is right there for the most unbelieving person in the entire world to simply have the word shed light on a subject or on, on, a, on an area it's literally this fast. Whoa, I see that. His grace is for me. A whole life could be changed in that amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. But they're walking around in the dark. Nobody's lit the match in the corner for them to look at something new, something else to see. 
they've just been to church with grandma and they, they remembered how, you know, grandpa got mad because that other guy, you know, crawfished on a business deal and he didn't want to go to church because he was sitting on the other side and so grandpa stayed out of church for 20 years because that other guy did something wrong. That's an example from our family. It happens. Because we don't have enough spiritual maturity to see what God's word says about my life and me have the audacity like Jesus to go into a world that is dying and say, I have the answer. He said, I am the answer. But I get to say, I have the answer because I'm in Christ and he's in me. I brought him with me today. Not just to church, but I can say that on Thursday morning if I go to the Y. Or if I, I can say it on Friday night if I go to a basketball game. I can say it wherever I go. I see somebody hurting. I see somebody struggling. I can say there's an answer. Yes. Yeah. There's an answer. And lastly, last verse of Scripture, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be added. Seek means to pursue, to study, to desire, explore, learn, consider, and understand. That's what you should be about where the kingdom is concerned. You should explore it. You should learn about it. Consider the kingdom above everything else. Understand kingdom things above everything else. Seek first. That's self-explanatory. It needs to be our top priority, like I was saying earlier. Our very, very top number one priority. The principal thing in our life. Seek first the kingdom. We seek a kingdom and not a religion. We seek a kingdom, not some form of a ritual. Now, we laugh at the movies, the old black and white movies where they're dancing around a totem pole. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. I know a lot of people today, their prayer life isn't much different. It looks different because they don't chant the same words Amen or oh me. Let's get past that. Let's get past thinking that some ritualistic thing is going to impress God and get over to the place that we know that we're dearly beloved, yes. that we have a father that cares intimately about us and wants to show us things pertaining to the kingdom so that the kingdom can be developed in our life and the kingdom can literally be displayed in our life. Very last thing that I wrote down here was this. The kingdom... In that verse of scripture, seek first the kingdom. It's the Greek word basileia. It's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew mamlaka. It literally is translated as dominion. Dominion. Seek first the dominating force. Seek first the kingdom way to get things done and his righteousness. So there's a righteousness that goes with the kingdom, and we'll talk about that next week. There's a right way to get kingdom things done. The kingdom way is the right way. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. So the kingdom is inherently right. So Jesus is saying, don't seek after these other things. Seek the dominating factor that will allow you to dominate your world. Seek the dominant way to live, provided literally by the king himself. <laughs> the king himself has provided a way. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give the Lord Jesus a hand clap today. Thank him. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in him.